Well, however outlandish that may sound, the sort of idea still dominates our culture that animals are there for our benefit. We need to find an entirely new view of the world. We need to try to see things through the eyes of other creatures instead of all the time through our own self-interested eyes. Flowers, the bees might say, are there to provide us with pollen and nectar. But even the bees haven't quite got it right. They're a lot more right than we would be if we think that flowers are there for our benefit. The fact is that flowers, or at least the bright and showy ones, are there because, in a sense, bees have cultivated them, domesticated them. When I say bees, I include butterflies and other sorts of pollinators. This is why I use the word garden in the title of this lecture. But why the ultraviolet garden? Well, that's a parable, like the parable of the Good Samaritan or the sower. Ultraviolet light is a kind of light that we can't see. It's just like ordinary light, except that it's a different wavelength and we can't see it. Bees can see it, they see it as a distinct colour, and bees cannot see red. So flowers are bound to look very different through the eyes of bees. And in just the same way, the question, what are flowers good for, is a question that we have to look at through the eyes of bees. Well, as I say, we, we can't see ultraviolet, and it's no use trying to capture what it would be that a bee would see if it looked at flowers. All we can do is to play with a few tricks to get some flavour of what it might be like. Now here is a row of tubes containing a white, white substances, all different white substances. They all look alike, they all look white. But if we now expose them to ultraviolet light for a while, they glow different colours. Now, this is a bit of a cheat. We're not actually seeing ultraviolet. None of those colours is actually ultraviolet. Those are all visible colours that we can see. What we are doing, though, is using this as a, again as a kind of metaphor to show how what we see is changed in ultraviolet light. That isn't what bees would see, but it gives us an idea of how different things might look through the eyes of bees. Actually, flowers probably look even more different because when bees see shape, they see shape in a very different way from us. When a bee sees a complicated shape like this set of leaves here or any of these flowers, it probably doesn't see it as a shape like that. It probably sees us as something that we should call flicker. You see little light bulbs flickering in the flowers now. And uh, once again, that almost certainly isn't quite what the bees see, but it's, it's likely to be a bit more like what the bees see than what we see when we see complicated shapes like that. And now we have a film here which again is trying to give an impression of what the ultraviolet garden might look like. We're seeing a whole set of flowers, both as we see them and then as the bee might see them in ultraviolet. So there's a flower as we might see it, white and yellow. There it is as a bee might see it, with the centre picked out in ultraviolet. Once again, we see a yellow flower, and to the bee, it would appear to glow with a strange, unearthly ultraviolet light. Again, a bit of a cheat, because we don't actually uh, know what ultraviolet would look like. But it's just trying to give you some idea of how different it would be for a bee. And in any case, we're only using this strangeness as a parable for changing our point of view about who or what it is that flowers and all other living creatures are for the good of. So let's now ask what bees are good for from the point of view of flowers. Well, flowers are sex organs designed by natural selection to make male and female cells and bring them together. There are good genetic reasons that apply in most flowers, though not all, for making sure that they don't mate with themselves. It would be all too easy for a flower to mate with itself. It's got pollen and a stigma in the same physical flower. And they use bees, butterflies, hummingbirds and other pollinators to transport the pollen from one flower to another. The usual way to do this is to bribe them with nectar. Here you see a hummingbird feeding from a flower with nectar. The bright colours are like Piccadilly Circus. It's an advertisement telling the hummingbirds or bees to come and feed from here. Now, 
nectar is made specially for the purpose and it's costly and there are some flowers that get away without producing nectar like this orchid this is a hammerhead orchid it mimics an, a wasp and the wasp comes and thinks that it's a female wasp and tries to mate with it there's a very spectacular hinge there that you'll see the use of there are the pollen sacs there are the pollinia and there's the the hinge and there's the fake female now look what's happened the male bees come and been dashed onto the pollen there going back and forth on that hinge banging away <laughs> and sooner or later the pollen sacs will come off onto his back there he is now with his back there and there are the pollen sacs on his back and he flies off and then he'll mate with another flower and just the same thing will happen this is a bucket orchid an even more ingenious trick it uses it's dropping fluid into the bucket there this is an attractive fluid there's a special kind of green bee which is attracted by that fluid it comes to the flower and it falls into the bucket there it's trapped there the only way it can get out is through a special hole that's provided for it by the orchid there's the hole it's the only way out and the bee has found it it's forced out through that hole and on its way out there is the pollen sac waiting so the only way through is this little passage there are the pollen sacs and it's going to get scraped off onto the bee's back on the way out now that same bee when it finally escapes with the pollen sacs on its back is going to fly off and it will eventually come to another bucket orchid and exactly the same procedure will be repeated it'll nearly drown it will find the hole and on its way out the pollen sacs will in this case be scraped off and they will fertilize the next orchid so this is deceiving bees, and, but again using their wings to carry pollen about. The pollination services offered by bees are truly massive. Somebody in Germany calculated that in Germany alone, honeybees pollinated about 10 trillion flowers in the course of a single summer day. It's also been calculated that about 30% of all human foods depend upon bee pollination. If bees were wiped out, 30% of our food plants would be wiped out as well. The world of bees is totally dominated by flowers. I don't just mean honeybees, there are lots and lots of species of bees. Many of them are solitary, not living in hives. The larvae of bees are almost all fed on pollen. We've got lots of flowers. Would anybody like to come and investigate the pollen here? Yes. Now, if you'd like to just come and sniff on it, try sniffing that, that one. Get your nose well into it. That's right. Get well in there. That's right. Now, now let's, what's your name? Richard. Richard. Let's have a look at Richard's nose. You can see the pollen all over it there. Now, if he were to go and do that to another flower, we see another one? No, let's not bother about that. Thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> So that's what bees are doing millions of times over every day. They feed their larvae on it. Their aviation fuel is nectar, and that's entirely provided for them by flowers. They work hard for their nectar reward. To make a one pound jar of honey, it's been worked out that bees would have to visit about 10 million clover blossoms. So flowers use bees, and bees use flowers. Both sides in the partnership have been shaped by the other. Both sides, in a way, have been domesticated, cultivated by the other. The ultraviolet garden is a two-way garden. But just because flowers and bees have evolved towards partnership, we mustn't assume that creatures in general work in a friendly way for one another's good. There are people who think that antelopes are there for the benefit of lions, uh, and indeed that lions are there for the benefit of antelopes to keep their population down. And that's just as much nonsense as the idea that oxen come willingly to the slaughter for the benefit of us.